The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast. My name is Ben Frost. I'm with APA's Northern New England chapter and one of the coordinators of the planning webcast series. This series is brought to you by a consortium of over 50 of APA's chapters and divisions. The consortium itself is not affiliated with APA, but rather is a loose-knit association whose mission is to provide high-quality free webinars on topics important to planners that will also help them meet their certification maintenance requirements. Today is Friday, March 2nd, 2018, and we'll hear the presentation, Big House, Little House, Back House, ADU. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found on the webcast toolbar on the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown here. For content related questions related to the presentation, please type those questions in the question box also loca located in the webinar toolbar on the right side of your screen. We'll answer those as time allows at the end of the presentation. And on your screen now is a list of the chapter uh, sponsoring chapters and divisions. I wanna thank all of them for making these webcasts possible. Uh, and if you don't see your chapter or division listed here, talk to someone in your chapter or division leadership and get them on board. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Northern New England chapter of APA. And here's a list of our few, uh, a few of our upcoming webcasts. Uh, we are booking now into the second half of the year. We do have a few dates still open uh, to register for any of these. Please visit our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And note uh, the presentation on the 9th of March next Friday uh, is Land Use Mobility Technology in Urban America. Features the speaker Gabe Klein, who is, uh, appears in an article uh, on inclusive mobility in the February uh, edition of Planning Magazine. So register for that, tune in, and uh, enjoy it. To log your credits, um, go to uh, I follow these instructions. The uh, event number for today's uh, webcast is 9143968. Like many of us has, you can like us on Facebook and get the greatest and best information and the most up-to-date information on upcoming webcasts. And we are recording today's webcast and it will be available on our YouTube channel soon. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, a PDF of today's PowerPoint will also be available on the ohioplanning.org planning webcast web page. Now, normally, uh, I'm in the position of uh, introducing the speakers, and I have today the, the dubious honor of, in fact, introducing myself. I am your uh, speaker for today, presenting Big House, Little House, Back House, ADU. Uh, and that's me. I'm the Director of Legal and Public Affairs at the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, where I'm internal legal counsel and I uh, actively engage with our state uh, legislature and congressional delegation on housing policy issues. Um, I've been a planner in New Hampshire for, well, well in, in, in the region, uh, in New York and Vermont and Maine and New Hampshire for the past 30 years. And I've been practicing municipal law in New Hampshire for the past 20 years. Um, been a member of the um, executive committees of the uh, Northern New England chapter and the uh, New Hampshire Planners Association for the past 15 years in different capacities. What we're going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to give you a background uh, to accessory dwelling units and some examples, and then give you the New Hampshire context. Uh, I do believe in truth and advertising, and um, uh, this is uh, this, the core of this presentation is about New Hampshire, but then I'm going to back it out to a broader context, the 35,000-foot view, if you will. Uh, to talk about uh, ADUs in the news, um, look, what you need to look for in state laws, and certain considerations you might want to make when looking at your local zoning ordinances. And then we'll do Q&A at the end. So here's the background. Um, the title to this presentation is evocative of uh, the vernacular architecture of New England farms, that is the extended attached buildings. Uh, and a book by this, this title, Big House, Little House, Back House, Barn. So put yourself back 150 years, the close of the Civil War, 
And imagine the sort of activity that was taking place in this farmstead. This is now the New Hampshire Farm Museum in Milton, New Hampshire, which uh, interestingly enough was a place that I used to drive by as a kid on, as my family was uh, on our way from my home in Ipswich, Massachusetts, driving up Route 16 to the White Mountains to, uh, to vacation and hike. Um, and I always looked at this place and it was derelict at the time. And I thought, I want to live there and I want to restore this building. Well, someone beat me to it uh, and it is now in beautiful shape and serves as the farm museum. But imagine this now, 150 years ago, who was living there? Imagine the, the bustling activity that was going on there. Intergenerational living, uh, farm hands hired to help the, the owner with uh, the management of the farm, a lot of activity, uh, people living in relatively close proximity. And this is not an unusual thing for us culturally as a civilization. Uh, and amongst most uh, different cultures, look at the, the, the cliff dwellers of Mesa Verde in the American Southwest. These are people who are living close together. Uh, and it's not, it's not a, an unusual concept. It's not hard to grasp. Certainly kids can get it. So this is the, uh, the golden hall at Medeseld from the Lord of the Rings, a Lego set. Uh, and this, what's this outbuilding? Well, it's probably a stable, but there would be people living in that stable, making it operate essentially as a detached accessory dwelling unit. And then, of course, there's Downton Abbey. Who doesn't miss Downton Abbey? I sure do. I uh, watch it on reruns. Now, what was the structure of Downton Abbey but a very large single family home? Now, I ask you the question, where, when they got married, did Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes live? They moved to a cottage on the estate. And this cottage is irrefutably a detached accessory dwelling unit. We see these sorts of depictions of living in our culture and we accept them as the norm. And yet we recognize that people have a struggle in establishing these uses now in part because of regulatory barriers. So what are ADUs? They are a second smaller dwelling on the same grounds as a single family home. They can be attached or detached. They come in different forms, whether it's an apartment over a garage or your college student returned living in the basement, but you want to give them their own space and you really do want them to have their own space or a converted outbuilding, say a chicken coop that's been converted into a dwelling. They go by lots of different names. Granny flats in the British Commonwealth, in-law apartments, family apartments, secondary units, whatever the name is, they're all describing the same thing, accessory dwellings. And this word accessory is one that has distinct and important legal meaning. Now you need to look to your own state law, whether it's statutory or case law to figure this out. But generally speaking, an accessory use is one that is customarily, historically, culturally, incidental to the a primary use and subordinate to it as well. So it's smaller of lesser impact, a secondary use. Here's some examples of ADUs from out west. And this, these are from the uh, website accessorydwellings.org, which I commend to your attention. It's a really good website. It is primarily geared toward homeowners who wish to create accessory dwellings or uh, or contractors who have an interest in, in doing that for their clients. Uh, so it does have that twist to it. It's not really about regulations so much as it is examples of how people have done ADUs uh, in different parts of the country, but primarily in the Pacific Northwest. So these two examples are from Eugene and, and Portland, Oregon. Uh, the first one on the left, uh, and this is the owner's name, Bob Harris, uh, he uh, needed to create an in-law apartment uh, for his mother-in-law and did. And you can see that it was done really tastefully. Uh, it's this wing that is in the fore, uh, foreground of the, the image. And viewed from the street, you don't really know what it is. It could be just a big family room, a great room, um, a rec room. Uh, but in fact, it is a, an in-law apartment. Um, this was not cheap. This was done in 2007 at a cost of uh, $170,000. Uh, but you can see how easily it works with the existing architecture. On the right side of the screen in Portland, Oregon, you have a, 
uh, converted garage in someone's backyard in, in Portland's historic district. So you can imagine the sort of permitting regime this went through. And it is a beautiful thing, but it's rel relatively small. Two stories, but comes in at only 440 square feet and was built in, was converted to this use in 2015. So there are lots of good examples on this website. Um, so here are some of the benefits of ADUs. Uh, and and these are really important. They're kind of a sales pitch. And I've used this a number of different times to convince people that ADUs are, are not uh, something to fear, but can actually be of benefit to their communities. They can increase your housing supply without further land development. Uh, because it's based on, an ex generally speaking, based upon an existing structure. Although you could establish an ADU with a new, uh, newly built single family home. It, it facilitates the efficient use of your existing housing stock and your infrastructure. Um, think about the impact on roadways. You don't need to build new roads for accessory dwelling units. It can be an affordable housing option for lots of people, uh, although it generally speaking would be done without any sort of regulatory control. That is, you're not gonna be, as a municipal regulator, you're not gonna be income qualifying the tenants who occupy an accessory dwelling unit. From the homeowner's perspective, it can be really important. It can improve the homeowner's cash flow to help them to pay their tax bills, to help them pay their mortgage, uh, to help them um, deal with uh, sundry uh, bills that they might have. And uh, really importantly, it can be helpful to people who are elderly or disabled, and they want to either continue to live where they have been living, or they want to live close to family members or to a caregiver. Uh, and this is something that we see uh, uh, increasingly as our population ages. Now, coming back east, here are a couple of examples from New Hampshire. Uh, on the left is, this is not technically speaking an accessory dwelling unit because it's multiple units here, but I use this because it's, it's a good example of how tastefully a conversion from single family use to multifamily use can be done. In fact, I think there are probably four or five units in this building, but you don't, looking from the street, which is where this picture was taken from, you don't know how many units are in that building. It looks like just a really well-kept single family home. And on the, the right side of the screen uh, is a picture I took uh, this winter uh, in Concord, New Hampshire, our, our state's capital, in preparation for developing a guidebook for uh, municipalities on ADUs. And you can see uh, on the right side of the, that picture, uh, the second entrance, the other, the front door to this this house is on the um, the other side of the building. It's on a corner lot, and I don't know why they didn't shovel their steps. So here's the challenge for you: find the hidden accessory dwelling unit in this uh, property in Davisville, New Hampshire. That's the Davisville section of Warner, New Hampshire. So you think you got it? That's where it is. It's above the garage. The entrance is in the back of the building, not visible from the street. So looking at this, this structure from the street, you would not know uh, that there was an accessory dwelling unit. And how do I know what's there? Well, it's because I used to live there. So when, when my wife and I were, as it were, forming a new household, um, we were looking for a place to live and she was living in, or working in one part of the state and I was working in another part of the state and we wanted to find a place that was centrally located for us relative to our commutes. And Warner proved to be a really great place. Uh, it's a small town of 2,800 people, uh, but it's close to Concord, it's close to Lebanon where she worked. So it was really good for us. And so uh, we weren't ready to buy a home, so we needed to find a place to rent. And so I use this example as um, a means of talking about the importance of a healthy rental housing supply to promote labor mobility. So we were the labor and we needed a place to live that we weren't gonna buy. And it turned out this was a really wonderful place for us. So improving the rental supply of your communities can help induce labor growth. So backing out a little bit, uh, the history of accessory dwelling units, these were really common up through the early 20th century, a common feature in single family homes. Uh, they were not unusual, but post-World War II, we see the rapid suburbanization and deployment of what we know as Euclidean zoning after Euclid versus Ambler. Um, and the, the 
desire to separate uses that were deemed to be incompatible. Uh, with, with all of this activity, ADUs became far less prevalent uh, and, and brought on with the baby boom, the car boom, the sprawl boom. Uh, there was a lot less interest in efficient use of space. We had, you know, the, the sky was the limit. We had great horizons. We were going out and conquering the world. We didn't need accessory dwelling units. And there was much easier mortgage financing. So think about the, uh, the benefits that returning vets had uh, to buy homes and the rapid construction that was going on at that time. But things are changing. We know this. So I want to back, uh, come, come back to New Hampshire a little bit and talk about the context here um, because we have a new accessory dwelling unit law that has some uh, background to it. Um, now, this is information that was created by the, the Pew Research Center and published uh, in May of 2016. This is not New Hampshire data, it's national data, but it, it serves as an important context for us. And just focus on the headline here. Living with a parent is the most common young adult living arrangement for the first time on record. And this goes back to 1880. So living with your parents is more common now than any other sort of living arrangement. This is a this is a real shift in how we find ourselves living as young adults. And I'm no longer a young adult, I'm, I'm an aging boomer. So I look to my kids, my millennial kids, and they're, they more likely fit this sort of thing. Um, and there is a difference between men and women. Uh, men in this age group are much more likely to li be living with their parents than women are. Although you see the trend lines going from 1960 for both men and women, uh, they are increasingly more likely to be living with their parents. Now, New Hampshire uh, is the third oldest state in the country, at least based on median age. Uh, we have been vying for a second spot with Vermont uh, neck and neck for a few years now. This is based on the 2016 ACS. Um, and so you, you, you look at this and you say, well, New Hampshire is really old. Right, we're older than Florida. We're older than West Virginia. Uh, Utah is, of course, the youngest state. Uh, the median age of the U.S. and entire population is 37.9, but New Hampshire is 42.7 and increasing in age as we go through time. So you think, well, New Hampshire is a really old state. Well, yes and no. Here's some other information from the Pew Research Center. And if you look at, that's, for, that's New Hampshire for those of you who aren't familiar with our geography. Um, if you look at the colors of these, th this, this map, which depicts the percentage of a county's population age 65 and older, the darker the color, the greater the percentage. And you can see some areas of the country are really dark. Uh, and that's an aging population, parts of Arizona where people have retired, parts of Florida where people have retired, parts of the Dakotas where people have just grown old. New Hampshire doesn't have those dark colors. We're really more of middle of the pack. And why is that? Well, look at our population pyramid. On the, on the left side of the screen is the United States population pyramid, and you can see the two bulges. The, the upper bulge is the baby boom population. Uh, the lower bulge is the millennials, their children, essentially. Um, and you can see those, those bulges echoed in the New Hampshire population, but uh, in a much more exaggerated fashion. So when we look at New Hampshire's median age as being very old, it's because we have so many boomers, not because we have so many elders yet. Although what's going to happen to the boomers? They're going to become elders. Rents in New Hampshire, up, up, up. You don't really see much of an influence of the Great Recession here, except for maybe a flattening of the curve. Um, our vacancy rate, our rental vacancy rate is critically low. In 2017, it was 1.7 for the entire state. There are some counties in New Hampshire that effectively have a 0% vacancy rate. Um, <clears throat> looking back in time, you can see that New Hampshire, it, it, it's the vacancy rate you know, peaked a bit in the Great Recession, but go back in time to the early 90s. That was New Hampshire's Great Recession. There was a lot of speculative building that occurred in the 80s. And the economy tanked, and the New Hampshire economy gravely suffered. A lot of banks went out of business. A lot of builders went out of business. And they never quite recovered, the builders anyway. Median home purchase price, 
have recovered from the Great Recession. So New Hampshire lost a little under 20% of its uh, aggregate value in home property, uh, property value in the Great Recession. We've regained that. Uh, not as bad as places like Nevada and California and Florida, but still it was, it was kind of tough. Um, but it has recovered. And so the market is really strong. Our housing inventory for sale has gone down, down, down. Um, and this means that there is a real dire need now for more housing units, and yet they're not being built. A few years ago, uh, New Hampshire Housing, my employer, uh, commissioned a study to be done by the New Hampshire Center for Public Policy Studies uh, to look at housing needs. And we we're statutorily, we we're, were not a state agency, but um, an, an entity created by state government. And the state government tells us what we're supposed to do. One of those things is to do a housing needs assessment. So we did a statewide housing needs assessment every five years or so. This time around, we wanted to do something a little different because we knew things were changing, but we didn't quite know how they were changing. So we hired the center to do the study for us. And they did a lot of, you know, they did the number crunching, but they also did some focus groups, a lot of interviews with different interest groups and uh, came to some interesting conclusions. One, things that we already knew. We have a slower population growth. We're not growing the way we used to. Uh, it used to be that New Hampshire led the uh, way of, uh, of New England out of recession. Didn't quite happen this time. We have an aging population. We've talked about that. But less commonly known, and what this study really brought forward, was that there was a fundamental mismatch in our housing stock uh, between the, uh, the needs and desires, the changing population, and what we have on the ground. We have a lot of big single family homes, and yet we have families of decreasing size, no longer needing these big, big family homes. The other thing too, and, and this is becoming more and more evident, uh, older adults want to age in place or age in their community. So they want to stay in their home or at least stay within the community where they have really strong social networks. The idea of moving away to Sun City is no longer uh, the norm, although we do have a lot of what we call snowbirds here in New Hampshire, people who move to Florida for five months of the year. And having just been down there, I can understand why. What does this mean? What do these uh, demographic changes mean? What do these market changes mean? We, well, we know we need to age, we need to house an aging population. We know, and particularly from New Hampshire's perspective, we need to attract and retain a younger workforce to replace those people, those aging boomers as they retire, people like me. But what are the housing policy implications of these changes? And we ask this question, do these different groups, the aging boomers and the millennials, do they want the same things? Yeah, they want an urban, I say urban-ish environment because you know New Hampshire has, well, we have a population of 1.3 million. We're a small state. Our largest city is 110,000. 110, um, that's the city of Manchester. Next largest is, is Nashua at about 90,000. We have a lot of small communities, but they have urban cores. They have villages that are walkable, maybe not with transit, but have significant cultural amenities. And they, have the, they provide the social network, the third places, if you will, for people to gather and, and be together. Um, so do these groups want the same things? Yeah. Now, imagine you've got a, uh, a boomer couple that are downsizing. They, they have their big single family home, they've raised their kids, the kids are gone, they don't want the kids to move back, so they're gonna sell, they're gonna move to a smaller place where the kids can't live, but they wanna stay in the community. So they, they have a lot of cash equity in the home. As they sell, they have cash up front. They can, they can make a cash bid on uh, a home for sale. A millennial couple looking at the same, uh, the same building, the same home, uh, saddled with student debt and other kinds of debt, no cash on hand. Who's going to win that bidding war? Well, follow the money. The boomer's always going to win that bidding war. And yet they're looking for oftentimes the same things. I say this better living in less space. Yeah, maybe. So this is um, an apartment in, um, in Manhattan. And with a few adjustments, this could also be uh, one that is wheelchair accessible. You know, you change the location of a couple of the appliances, do some recessed counters, 
uh, move move a few of the, the drawers around, and you've got something where someone can really age in place regardless of mobility disabilities, but it's also the sort of place that would appeal to someone who's young and wants a thriving urban environment. Now let's turn to the New Hampshire law, the ADU law. There was this backstory as all these demographic and market changes that were going on, but also uh, home builders in the state found that they were increasingly unable to fulfill, fulfill their clients' requests to create ADUs, either for a family member or for a caregiver or for whatever purpose. And this is be not because there was a lack of, of funding or financing, but because local regulation either outright prohibited the creation of accessory dwellings or uh, placed onerous conditions on their establishment. And so the home builders uh, sought legislative relief and they had introduced legislation. Hey, back. Ben, it's Christine. I'm interrupting you. Um, I just got a ton of emails that people can't see your slides. They can't see my slides. No, what they see is your desktop with your cute dog. <laughs> oh. Are you, um, do you have two screens? I do, and it should be showing think, the second screen. I think it, it might be showing the other one. No, it's up on both. Oh, it is? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I can't log in because you are logged in. Because I'm on the account. <laughs> so I can't see anything. I'm just going off of um, the emails that I'm getting. Um, All right, I'm changing the settings again. Yeah, OK. Well, you know what? Um, um, we've just installed a new system here, and I thought that uh, my IT department had troubleshot it. So apparently not. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. You got? I just got an email from someone. You got it now. OK. Well, it's I working did... now. OK, now all the emails are coming back in. It's working. Oh, yay. OK. Wonderful. <laughs> Apologies well, you... for the interruption, but all of a sudden I checked my email and thought, oh, dear. <laughs> all right, so I guess. Um, uh, Chris, do you think I should uh, start over at a different date? Um, <clears throat> I think that's up to you. Um, I'm not sure how far you've gotten in or what your content has been like. Um, About halfway that's through. That's up to you. Okay. Um, I, don't, I guess, I, I don't know. I think it, at this point, perhaps I'd continue, and then we'll just make sure that we have the slides up. I see a comment. Let's continue. All right. I'll go with yeah, that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Don't you love technology? Um, so I did, we had a new system installed and I worked through this with my IT department yesterday and everything was working fine. I even tested it with a, a dummy, uh, not a dummy, but a really smart person. Um, so I just want to show a couple of the slides that you couldn't see before. Um, a couple of the pictures. Um, so that's, so these are a couple of ADUs that um, are in the accessorydwellings.org website. Check that out. I strongly encourage you to. Uh, and yes, my dog is cute, isn't he? Um, and here are, let's see, here are the two examples from New Hampshire, uh, the converted farmhouse and the in-town ADU. And I'm just going to speed through this. This is the place where I lived. And yes, there is the hidden ADU. And I'm going to speed through these. Recognize that these slides will all be available on the Ohio Planning uh, website, ohioplanning.org slash web planning webcast. OK, and there's the Manhattan apartment where you might get people, boomers and millennials competing. Now, here's the New Hampshire law. Um, there are a couple of defining characteristics. There's a definition of what an ADU is. It's an independent living unit with these four things, sleeping, eating, cooking, uh, uh, and sanitation facilities. Uh, it could be a studio. It could be multiple rooms. Um, the owner has to demonstrate the adequacy of water supply and sewage disposal, whether it's on public sewer or a septic system. And this is New Hampshire. We have a lot of septic systems. In fact, that is the primary means of septic disposal uh, septic in, in, in the state. 
There's also a requirement for an interior door between the primary unit and the accessory dwelling unit. Recognize that this law only requires municipalities to allow an attached ADU. It does not compel municipalities to allow detached ADUs. Uh, so there's this issue of the interior door, and you might ask, well, why, why do you need to have an interior door between the two units? Well, there are, there's, there's two reasons. One is that it allows for easy reincorporation of the ADU into the primary unit should the needs of the owner, the occupants, change over time, and they do change over time. So you might have a three-bedroom home that's converted to a two-bedroom home and a one-bedroom ADU, maybe the next owner needs those three bedrooms and they want to have that connection. So it does require this uh, connection uh, between the units. Uh, the, the other reason uh, for the interior door requirement is that um, is a political one, and this is a sausage-making story. The uh, chairman of the relevant committee in the New Hampshire House of Representatives um, was not really thrilled with this bill uh, and he sought to kill it, but he was compelled or convinced by one of his committee members to hang on to the bill and to work with it. And he did. He's a friend of mine, so I could I talked with him uh, about this. Um, but what he wanted was to make sure that his town didn't have to change its zoning ordinance in response to this new law. And his town requires an interior door between the units. So that's the, the real story behind the interior door requirement. That is truly sausage in the making. Now, in New Hampshire, if the zoning ordinance, if your local zoning ordinance is silent on ADUs, then they are allowed in any single family home by right. Uh, and the, this last bullet on this slide is really the most important one. Standards for a single family home also apply to the combination of the single family home and the ADU. So no increases in lot sizes or setbacks or frontage, no changes to dimensional requirements if someone wants to put in an ADU. Uh, so here are some options under the, the state's law for uh, ADUs. The municipality may require adequate parking. They may require owner occupancy of one of the units, but can't say which one. Uh, and they can require demonstration that the unit is the owner's principal place of residence. So think of domicile for the purposes of voting or registering your vehicle. They can also control for architectural appearance or look and feel in the language of the statute, uh, aesthetic continuity. Uh, they can limit the number of ADUs per single family dwelling. This is a municipal options. And they can limit the number of unrelated individuals that occupy a single unit. This was a concern expressed by some college towns here in New Hampshire, which you know have uh, a lot of students uh, bunking up together in, in a single dwelling unit and causing a crowding problem. Uh, what can't they do? They can't limit ADUs to one bedroom. They can't require them to be smaller than 750 square feet, but they can set otherwise set minima and maxima. And even though you know, the name is traditionally mother-in-law apartments, municipalities in New Hampshire cannot require a familial relationship between the occupants of the principal dwelling and the ADU. And then there's this interior door they can't require that it remain unlocked. So consider you're, you're uh, either a landlord or a tenant. How many of you have had either a crazy landlord or a crazy tenant? Uh, I'll raise my hand to that. I want that door to remain locked. And finally, uh, there's this uh, dimensional requirement standard. Uh, there are some other things that go on in this statute too. Detached ADUs are wholly at the municipality's discretion. They can decide whether to allow them or not. Um, even though this law was passed uh, two years ago and went into effect June 1st of 2017, last year, the New Hampshire legislature, as it is wont to do, continued to tinker with the law and passed a couple of uh, further modifications. One, dealing with condo conversions uh, uh, that is effectively prohibiting the future condominium conveyance of accessory dwelling units. And the other, dealing with adequacy of septic systems, meaning that municipalities in New Hampshire can't require a new septic system to be built because of an ADU unless it was originally made, unless the septic system was originally unpermitted or is in failure. Um, but they can require a new plan, a new, a new design to be put on record. Uh, some of the FAQs that we've uh, done with regard to the New Hampshire law 
isn't this just a duplex? Well, no, not really. If you think about it, I mean, so this is this is maybe splitting hairs for for some of you, but uh, a duplex is essentially two co-equal units in a structure. And you look at a building, and it's a mirror image. So that's that's a duplex. The, here, remember uh, the the notion of this being an accessory use. It's secondary or subordinate to the primary use as a single-family dwelling. Um, this reference to workforce housing is a New Hampshire specific thing, so I'm going to skip over that. Uh, impact fees, you need, do need to think about how, if you have an impact fee ordinance, how they will apply to the creation of this accessory dwelling unit. And that will depend on how the impact fee ordinance is written. So, for example, if you have an impact fee ordinance that charges a fee based upon units, would you then consider the accessory dwelling unit to be an additional unit? Under New Hampshire law, my argument is no, because that's the way the law is written. Your law may be different, so you need to look at this closely. Uh, what does attached mean? Recognize that the New Hampshire law only re requires municipalities to allow attached ADUs. I've been faced with a question actually by a, a planner from our lakes region. Um, he, he said uh, during a, a, a presentation I was making, he said, Ben, I've, I've got this, this house with a 300 foot long breezeway connecting to another structure. Is that attached? I suppose technically it is, but is there an interior door there? Probably not. I think the, the simplest way to deal with attached is to look for some reasonable attachment, not a 300 foot long breezeway, but a connecting wall a common wall between the units or heated space between the units or limitation on how long that breezeway can be. Um, I've talked about the interior door. DES is the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and I've talked a little bit about uh, the standards there. They did actually, the state did change its septic standards, not in response to the ADU law, but as part of their overall rewrite. And there are I think reasonably uh, posited increased standards for the creation of an accessory dwelling unit, even if you're not increasing the number of bedrooms in a structure. So let's say you've got that three bedroom home and you're converting it to a two bedroom home plus, plus a one bedroom ADU, same number of bedrooms, but you've got two households and they're gonna be using those systems at the same time. Uh, so if they're both going into the same septic system, you need to look at the, and not so much the demand on the leach field, but the demand on the tank. What is the peak flow going into that tank? Uh, and that's typically going to be in the morning when people are taking showers and they're doing laundry and they're washing dishes and they're getting the kids ready to go. And that's when the stuff is flowing into the tank. And if that tank is inadequate, then you're going to get solids flowing into the leach field and the system will fail. And it's a, it is a public health issue. So I, I think our state, at least, reasonably requires increased um, system capacity for the development of an ADU. Um, homeowners associations and condo docs, uh, do they, can they prohibit ADUs? Sure, why not? Uh, now you need to look at your own state's condominium act uh, and how that plays out, but at least under, uh, under New Hampshire law, um, it, Condominiums uh, and homeowners associations uh, effectively trump that. That is a private contractual arrangement among property owners. Uh, and it's not in violation of the law, at least as, as I see it here, uh, for a, uh, one of these associations to prohibit ADUs. It's not something that a municipality polices. Um, owner occupancy. So a lot of um, uh, municipalities will have owner occupancy requirements. And this is not just in New Hampshire, but across the country. Um, what, if, what if the owner is a trust or an LLC or a corporation? Uh, this is a matter for, if not state law, then a question of local interpretation. If your state law is silent on this issue, then you've got to figure out what do you mean by owner occupancy? Could the owner be, say, the beneficiary of a revocable trust? which is essentially a transparent instrument, as opposed to an irrevocable trust, which is not, or maybe the managing member of an LLC or a, the owner of a closely held family corporation. Are they owners technically, legally? No, and a corporation is not a physical thing that can occupy space, nor is an LLC or a trust. 
So you need to look at this question. If you're going to compel owner occupancy, how rigidly are you going to interpret that? Um, there is reference in the New Hampshire law to HUD's occupancy standards. And uh, this goes back to a 1992, I believe, letter from a HUD official, uh, which expresses HUD's position, that is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, their position on occupancy standards relative to discrimination. And this was subsequently published in the Federal Register, I think in 2001 or 2002. And it's a letter that gives different examples of, of what HUD would consider to be discriminatory behavior on the part of landlords in whether to allow a tenant to occupy a space. But it is informative as well for municipalities because a municipality could be accused of discriminating against families uh, if it limits the number of occupants of, of, a, uh, of a unit, of a bedroom, um, irrespective of the conditions of the bedroom because this is what HUD is looking at. They're looking at uh, what, what's the situation? Is it a very large bedroom that could accommodate three people, or is it, uh, let's say, let's say your your zoning ordinance says no more than two people per bedroom? Well, what about a um, uh, a, a young couple with a baby? That's three people in one room, and would people argue that that's uh, overcrowding? Probably not. I don't think that would be enforceable. Um, and now, what about uh, short-term rentals, um, Airbnb, VRBO, uh, HomeAway, uh, which are increasingly, and certainly my wife and I traveled to Alaska recently and, and made great use of Airbnb and loved it, and it was wonderful, but it was also a permitted use and taxed by, uh, by the city of Homer, Alaska. Um, this is a real point of conflict over uh, local regulation and private land use. And I don't have a really good answer for it, but you simply need, as planners, you need to be aware that this is an issue and you're gonna have to address it one way or another. Uh, does your state law allow your municipality to uh, prohibit uh, the use of an accessory dwelling unit as short-term rental? Can you regulate short-term rentals at all as a municipality? You need to examine your state law and your capacity to do that sort of thing. What if we do nothing? Well, this is a, a question that we pose to New Hampshire municipalities. If you do nothing, then you're, you're going to have to allow ADUs as a matter of right under our law. Uh, so this is a guidebook that New Hampshire Housing published um, just last month, in fact, uh, Accessory Dwelling Units in New Hampshire. Uh, and there's the uh, website where you can get it, nhhfa.org slash accessory dwelling units hyphenated. Um, while this is tailored to the New Hampshire law and to New Hampshire municipalities under the New Hampshire Zoning Enabling Act, uh, it does contain uh, sample zoning language that could be used in a variety of jurisdictions. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that. There's also material in there, such as links to the, um, the, the, the HUD uh, occupancy standards, so you can find those materials uh, from this document. Uh, we're also in the process of developing a homeowner's guide to ADUs because uh, we recognize that there's a lot of people out there with questions. In fact, just today, I got an email from uh, someone in a town in New Hampshire um, saying that she rents uh, an in-law apartment uh, at a private residence, um, and she attempted to register her vehicle and was told by the town clerk that she couldn't register her vehicle because the accessory dwelling unit was illegal. Well, I don't know if it's illegal or not, um, but these are the sorts of concerns that, that homeowners and tenants are facing. So we're trying to help them address those. Now let's move back to the broader context, the, the 35,000 foot level, if you will, and take a look at uh, the, the concerns that people will have regarding uh, ADUs. First off, how much demand is there for this? Um, and I, I, I encourage you to take a look at, if you have, if you have access to the uh, Journal of the American Planning Association, JAPA, take a look at the spring 2017 uh, edition, volume 83, number two, which has this article in it, uh, Measuring Informal Housing Production in California Cities. Um, it's focused on California, but there's a lot of um, uh, background research on uh, the national trends in informal housing. What is informal housing? It's housing that's built without a permit. Uh, whether uh, 
predating zoning and subdivision, such as the uh, Colonias uh, developments that you might have seen in the American Southwest, um, or just things that are happening on people's property without them pro pulling the proper permits, without building permits, without uh, zoning approval. Uh, it includes significantly uh, accessory dwelling units, but it can include other things too, like someone having 10 acres and building the house without, a, without pulling a building permit. Uh, and what the authors of this article uh, found was that uh, informal housing is flourishing despite the ubiquity of land use regulations and enforcement of them. Um, and in fact, looking at in the part of the literature review that in this article was that different analyses have found that informal housing constitutes between 25% and 40% of all new housing units that are being created statewide. This goes back a couple of decades. This is, I, I was shocked when I read that, but then I got to think, well, what's going on in my neighborhood? And I think, yeah, I, I see that they've got an illegal ADU and they've got another one and they're doing this and friends of the family are doing this on their property. So it's out there. This is a response to an unmet need. Uh, that there's tremendous demand for uh, more housing in many of our markets. You think the Bay Area, you think uh, New York metropolitan area, you think of the Boston metro area, really tight housing markets. There's tremendous demand. And so this stuff is happening. So here's the problem, though. Informal housing, generally speaking, is not going to meet codes and can pose real safety hazards, as well as being... Uh, unaccounted for demands on municipal uh, services. Uh, so, you know, sewer connections and that sort of thing. Um, my real focus is on the safety hazards. I mean, no one's going to die because a municipality hasn't collected a sewer connection fee, but they do die because of faulty wiring and poor ventilation and bad construction. So this is a real concern. It's a real problem. What's the solution then? Well, there are a couple of alternatives. An enforcement crackdown, shut them all down. But uh, the, the, the authors of this article argue this is an inhumane approach because people need some place to live. Or is there some way of accommodating this demand? And so uh, years ago, um, I was the town planner in Hollis, New Hampshire. Uh, and I then later on became the town administrator. Um, and when I was the town planner, I realized that, you know, that the town had on its books this accessory dwelling unit uh, provision at, in, in the zoning ordinance. And I got the backstory on this. What, what Hall, and this is a, at, at the time it was a town of 5,700 people. In 2000, I haven't, I haven't checked on this more recently, but in 2000, uh, Hollis was the, the most affluent community in New Hampshire on a per capita income basis. It's a really wealthy town. Uh, and they've got this accessory dwelling unit uh, provision in their zoning ordinance. So I asked about it and where this came from. Where it came from was the town recognized they had a lot of illegal ADUs. And they decided, well, we can't beat them, so let's regulate them. And they gave essentially an amnesty period uh, for the property owners to come in and get a special exception for the create for the well, the creation, the legal establishment of what they already had going on on their property. And now um, there's, you know, 25 years later, uh, the town has, you know, something on the order of 50 ADUs, not a proliferation of accessory dwellings, but something that is meeting the needs of the townspeople. So I think there are ways of accommodating this need um, rather than uh, preventing it outright. And we see all sorts of interest in new styles of living. So go to Home and Garden TV, and there's a, there's a bunch of different shows on tiny houses. Now, typically, they're, they're shown on wheels because that's cool. Yeah, this is a niche market, certainly. But because of the interest that people have in it, I'm thinking, well, it may be more than a niche market at some point. And certainly, it is, it is filling an unmet need that people have. If you read City Lab, the Atlantic Monthly's online journal, um, it uh, have regularly has articles on housing issues, and they've been increasingly focusing on granny flats. This is from uh, just January of this year. Uh, and this picture is one of, uh, of a, an ADU in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and 
just a few weeks ago, this book was published, uh, Backdoor Revolution, The Definitive Guide to ADU Development. Um, this uh, It's a really great book. I've been re- making my way through it. It's uh, very uh, deep in its approach, and it is focused on providing information for property owners and people who are interested in developing accessory dwelling units. So it's not really a guide for municipalities, but there's some really useful information in there for municipal officials, for planners who are designing ordinances. Um, the, the author is Cole Peterson, uh, and he created this website for this. He is a, a really um, passionate advocate for accessory dwellings. Um, and he's also one of the editors of accessorydwellings.org, which is the site um, that has those examples that I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Um, Within this book, there's all kinds of information, uh, but for local officials, uh, there are some really, I think, um, uh, important cautions about the sorts of standards that you might adopt, because those standards may serve as barriers to the development of accessory dwellings. So uh, the 35,000 foot view, look to your state law. First off, are you a home rule or a Dillon's rule state? New Hampshire is a Dillon's rule state, so anything that a municipality ha- does, it has to look to an enactment, an ena- enabling legislation. If you're a home rule state, you have more freedom, but uh, you need to look, whether you're a home rule or a Dillon's rule state, you need to look at uh, enabling or constraining legislation. So is there something on the books that um, uh, it will, will uh, facilitate the development of accessory dwelling units or pose some sort of hindrance to them. Now, most enabling statutes are based on the Standard State Zoning Enabling Act, and that provides sufficient power to allow and regulate accessory dwelling units. But you might find that there are other statutes that your state has adopted that serve as barriers, either, I say, overtly or in some obscure corner of your regulations. So septic standards and utility interconnection requirements and that sort of thing. Then look to local laws. Uh, And I've got a couple slides dealing with this with a a few points. And I put put this mostly in the form of questions because these are the sorts of questions you would need to ask in designing uh, an ordinance to deal with ADUs. Um, uh, And and I think the most important Caution I have is uh, echoes what Cole Peterson says in his book, the greater the number and stringency of your standards, the fewer units will be created. What is it you're trying to regulate? First off, you can allow them by right or by special permit. You're gonna vary uh, the permitting by district. So say allow attached ADUs in your village center, but uh, also allow detached ADUs in your more rural district. Um, You're gonna allow detached at all. Uh, consider what attached means. Are you going to impose occupancy limitations? Uh, you're going to require owner occupancy. And how do you define owner? And how do you uh, police that? You're going to require some sort of annual permit for the, the owner to fill out and sign under penalty of perjury that they will occupy the unit. Are you going to require occupancy? You're going to limit it to family members. Um, I have always discouraged this. For the past 20 years, I have discouraged uh, municipalities from requiring um, owner or uh, family member occupancy because who's to say what a family member is? I mean, do you need to do a DNA test and who's going to do that? Uh, how do you police that? It's virtually unenforceable. And if if the standard you're adopting is virtually unenforceable, then why adopt it in the first place? Are you going to limit occupancy to caregivers? Uh, and this was a concern for people who you know, um, are disabled or elderly and need someone there to help them. Um, are you gonna limit the number of unrelated individuals occupying a unit as is a concern, as I've previously said in, in college towns. All of these sorts of concerns constrain who can build an ADU, who can occupy an ADU, and they limit the market for it and they will limit then in turn the number of ADUs that cr- get created. Are you going to require additional dimensional uh, uh, standards? So dealing with lot size or setback, lot coverage or density. So I ask, what is it that we're trying to regulate? And so I, I come up with this hypothetical example of you know, 20,000 square foot lots on Mulberry Street for Dr. Seuss fans. Um, 
And these, you know, they're 200 feet by 100 feet. And in lot A, you've got a 2,500 square foot house, a pretty good size uh, home with a 625 square foot detached garage, a thousand square feet of driveway. You get total lot coverage of 20.6%. That's impervious surface. Um, you add an ADU integrated in the existing dwelling and you haven't changed the lot coverage. Have you increased the density? Well, how is it that you're measuring density? Is it number of units? Then arguably, yes. Is it lot coverage? No, absolutely not. If you add an attached ADU, uh, you're adding, the, uh, adding to the lot coverage a bit, but you're still only at 25%, which really isn't a huge lot coverage. Let's say you love basketball, and you're going to build a 96 by 50 foot NBA regulation basketball court. But this being the Northeast, where we are right now in the midst of a wild and woolly nor'easter, you want to cover that sucker. So what's your lot coverage there? 53.1%. And you haven't even added an accessory dwelling. You've just built a basketball court. If you love cars, you get rid of the original garage, you build a really big one and pave your entire backyard, and you're up to 61% coverage. What is it that we're concerned about? What is it that we're trying to regulate? If we're concerned about uh, surface water runoff, if we're concerned about groundwater quality, then regulate for those purposes. Uh, don't use those regulations as a, or, or don't use those concerns as a means of saying, but we can't have ADUs because it's too dense. Well, I question that. Getting back to local laws and the sorts of concerns you have, are you going to require separate utility connections? And I ask, well, why not leave this up to the owner? What is it? Of, what's the concern of the municipality? Um, if you've got X number of bedrooms and say you're you're metering things on a single meter, it doesn't really matter whether there's two meters, you've got the same usage um, between two or one. Uh, what are the impact fee implications? And I've talked about uh, this a little bit before. You know. It really does depend on how your impact fee ordinance is written, if you have one. Uh, are you going to be dealing with it on a per bedroom basis or a per unit basis? Uh, it all depends on how the ordinance is written. Are you going to require architectural standards? <clears throat> and some, some municipalities do. Under New Hampshire law, they're enabled to. They can require, uh, as I said, architectural consistency or maintaining the look and feel or aesthetic continuity of the single family home, but what could the owner do in the absence of an ADU? Could they make something that looks really ugly? And the answer is probably yes, unless they're in an historic district with those sorts of uh, regulations. Uh, so I'd say I encourage some sort of architectural control, but don't go overboard on this. I talked a little bit before about Airbnb and VRBO. Um, there are a real, this is, this is an area that is fraught because the law is developing. Uh, you need to look to your state legislation to see what sort of capacity you as a municipality have to regulate uh, short-term rentals, if at all. Uh, and then are you going to look at minimum and maximum size restrictions of ADUs? You can come up with absolute uh, standards, you know, uh, it's like a minimum of 200 square feet and a maximum of 1,000 square feet. Actually, my town has a minimum of 300 and a maximum of 1,000 square feet for accessory dwelling units. Or you're going to make it as a proportion of the primary dwelling unit, so no more than 40% of the um, floor space of the primary dwelling unit or something like that. Um, in, in, in researching uh, these laws, I came across... Uh, this, which I found to be really fascinating. This is from the International Code Council, which publishes the International Residential Code. And in the 2015 IRC, they eliminated the requirement that a dwelling must have a room of at least 125, 120 foot square feet and that any other rooms must be at least 70 square feet. You could have a single unit of 120. <clears throat> and they've, they've eliminated that requirement. And so the, the standard now reads, Habitable rooms shall have a floor area of not less than 70 square feet, or 6.5 square meters. Uh, in in a, a media brief, the ICC said uh, this change will accommodate alternatives for very small dwellings that, that 
that would previously not have been allowed under the IRC. And this, this graphic came from the ICC itself. In that media brief, the ICC went on to say, um, the minimum area of 120 square feet was not based on scientific analysis or on identified safety hazards, but was generally accepted by code users and in the marketplace, meaning it's arbitrary, but everyone bought it, so let's enforce it. Um, and they went on, recently, however, proponents of minimalist living have advocated smaller dwellings to reduce environmental impact and provide for lower living costs through reduced mortgage and maintenance expenses. So the ICC is recognizing this so-called minimalist, and they went on to talk about tiny homes um, and the, the, the fact that the IRC was effectively preventing people from developing tiny homes. If you look at the website of for example, uh, tumbleweed tiny homes. I know they have they have a unit, a caravan unit that comes in at 96 square feet. I can imagine vacationing in a unit that size. I don't think I would want to live in it. But what I want is not necessarily what should govern everyone. And I think the ICC was recognizing that it was imposing a standard that it didn't necessarily need to do. And so here's. Here's the wrap up. Uh, we, in many, many markets across the country, we have a need for a lot more housing units. And that need is not being met because the units aren't being built for a variety of reasons. Uh, shortage of labor, cost of materials, uh, shortage of available developable land, but look at your zoning ordinance to see if it's constraining that too. Um, so there's opportunity here. And ADUs, in fact, are becoming a lot more popular. Just look at the news, uh, they're, they're out there. They can promote more efficient use of existing infrastructure, water, sewer, roads, uh, and they can provide more housing without further land development. No need for further subdivisions, you're just adding uh, new units to the existing uh, lots that have already been approved. And ADUs can provide housing that's more affordable. And I choose the language here carefully. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not calling it affordable housing, which has is both pejorative and has legal meaning too in some contexts. But it can provide housing that's more affordable without a penny of public subsidy and without any other public intervention. And by that, I mean no need for a municipal official to income qualify an occupant. Uh, in order for them to be able to live there. Let the owners determine this. Um, now, in some markets, uh, ADUs won't be affordable at all. In some markets, they will be used for short-term rentals exclusively. Um, but the more units that are out there, the more there will be available for the population that needs them. So let's go to Q&A now and we'll see what you have. I, have, I normally look at the questions in advance um, but I can't do both uh, the reading and uh, running the presentation. So let's see. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I have a, a comment from my friend David White. Lodi, my dog, looked great, though. I called that picture um, still life with dog and solar array. Uh, and that array is in my town of Warner. That's a municipal array. A question from John says, uh, generally are residential dwelling units accessory to a non-residential use? In my opinion, ADUs are not customarily incidental to a retail. Um, and I, I agree with that entirely. Um, I, there, I, although I suppose it, it is a matter of, of local interpretation. You could have, well, for example, you've got ground floor retail and second floor apartment. We call that mixed use. Is Could you say that that second floor retail or second floor apartment is accessory? You could, I suppose. Um, I don't think that it's, um, uh, at least I've, I've never considered it to be an aspect of mixed use. Um, here we have a question from David, have neighbors complained about the impact of ADUs on property values? How do you deal with this issue? Generally, the, the, the complaints that, that we have seen are expressions of fear about something that is proposed as opposed to something that has happened. Um, and I think it's, it's on the one hand, it's a common complaint for people to make or a common concern for people to express when 
um, a permit is being sought. Uh, but generally speaking, they're not borne out. I've not seen really a good hard data that suggest one thing or another. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the experience we've had is that they don't really impact uh, neighboring property values. But that doesn't mean people aren't going to complain about it. Um, and in fact, that is one of the reasons why, at least in New Hampshire, uh, the legislature felt compelled to adopt this law is to overcome the NIMBY factor because it was effectively thwarting uh, the development of a lot of ADUs that might otherwise have been there. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, let's see, Terry asks, are accessory dwelling units an issue elsewhere in the world, uh, in Europe, and how do they address it? I honestly don't know. Uh, I suspect that it is less of an issue in places where uh, home ownership is not as um, prevalent as it is in the U.S. I suspect it is less of an issue where you have already more compact living, which is the image I have of so much of Europe. Uh, that is you know, much more compact living and then protected landscape. So I think of places in Germany and uh, Denmark and England uh, where there's been a real concerted effort to constrain development and densify the existing developed areas. So you're not so much talking about accessory dwelling units there as just creating more units. Um, let's see. Do you see, and this is from Donna, do you see accessory buildings slash apartments being used as Airbnbs instead of primary housing? Oh yeah, I mean, any any occupiable space, uh, that any place that is fit for human habitation uh, as, a, as a living space uh, is, um, is game for uh, Airbnb and VRBO. As I said, when, when my wife and I went to Alaska, we, we did Airbnb and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, there though, it was permitted. Um, there is, I think, um, a, a risk to be recognized that if you're going to allow uh, accessory dwelling units, then you need to or should at least be aware of the potential that these units will be will not be used for long-term rentals by you know, residents of the community or, or surrounding communities that will add to your, your labor pool, but rather will be uh, simply tourist venues. Um, so that, that is a concern. Uh, is there a reason why parking needs associated with ADUs was not covered in your presentation? Um, I just didn't get to it. Um, so this is one of those things that uh, the New Hampshire law, <coughs> New Hampshire law says, in fact, I did cover that very briefly. Uh, the New Hampshire law says that municipalities can require demonstration of adequacy of parking whether that's on street or elsewhere, like a, a leased space or on, on site. Um, so and some municipalities do and some don't. Some will require uh, showing that there's parking for one car. Some will say two, uh, which depends on the number of bedrooms in the ADU, uh, how many spaces you need to devote to it. In, in uh, Cole Peterson's book, um, Backdoor Revolution, he is highly critical of parking requirements, um, but he's coming at it from the perspective of maximizing the development and the deployment of ADU. And he's he's looking to create a movement, which is really cool um, in, in terms of changing cultural perceptions on accessory dwelling units. But he sees parking requirements as a real problem. Um, it, the New Hampshire law does contain this provision that allows municipalities to require demonstration of adequacy of parking. This was done in a response to a state representative from Manchester, which does have a parking problem in parts of the city. Uh, and so the concern was, well, there will just be a proliferation of on-street parking, and that is a problem in Manchester. I know my daughter lives in Manchester, and she's got to be careful about where she parks or she gets towed. Uh, so it, it is a problem that should be, or it's a, an issue that should be addressed one way or another. Let's see. Um, the webinar will be available. We are recording so you can see the visuals you didn't get to see the first time around. Um, and the the PowerPoint will also be available. The, the recording will be available on the Planning Webcast YouTube channel. The PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Um, 
Question from Randy. Uh, what are the tax implications of adding the ADU? I assume that property taxes will increase accordingly, or is it a second second property tax is as or is it taxed as a separate structure? That's really a, a question of that's specific to your individual state and how your municipality is dealing with it. Uh, whether your taxes go up depends on whether the ADU adds value to the, the structure. And we've had some interesting discussions with, um, in fact, I made a presentation to the New Hampshire um, Assessing Association, and, and, and they're kind of mixed on this. But the more interesting comments we got were from appraisers who said sometimes an accessory dwelling unit does not add value to a home. Sometimes the highest and best use is as a single family home without an accessory dwelling unit. It really does depend on the market and it depends upon what you're adding to the structure. So if you're adding, let's say you've got a three bedroom home with one bathroom. If you add a bathroom, you're adding value. Generally speaking, uh, bathrooms are, are high value adds to a structure. If you're like making over your, your kitchen, you're adding value, those sorts of things. So if you're doing things that to the structure that are incidental to creating an ADU that would themselves add value, then you're probably going to be adding value. You're going to be increasing the assessed valuation and therefore you're going to be increasing the taxes. Whether it's a, a, a single tax bill or two tax bills, that's a, um, a state and local question. Under New Hampshire law, it would be a single tax bill. Let's see, other questions. In conversions with seniors in Southern New Hampshire region, the notion of going through the construction process of building an ADU seems to be overwhelming. Uh, this is from Sylvia, my friend. Um, any ideas on how we can make the process seem less overwhelming? Hmm. Well, um, I, th this is actually a very good question, Sylvia, for us to address uh, here at New Hampshire Housing, for us to address in uh, our homeowner's guide to ADUs. So I, I will actually be reaching out to you to um, dig into this question a little further, but it is overwhelming. If for anyone who has ever worked with a contractor, um, especially where labor is short and contractors are hard to find and hard to get to answer the phone, uh, it can be really difficult. Um, but this is the sort of um, construction management that people need to expect to have to do if you're gonna be your own general contractor. You have to be prepared to deal with your contractors. Uh, question, do you know of any jurisdictions where ADUs are subsidized by employers or local housing organizations such as a community land trust? Um, I, yes, but I, I can't recall off the top of my head uh, specifics. I know that there are some jurisdictions in California that are offering subsidies. I wanna say it was San Bernardino, but I can't recall exactly. I was at the National Planning Conference in New York City last year and went to a bunch of ADU sessions. And I, I recall a presentation on this that, that talked about subsidies for ADUs. Um, there, there are um, you know, municipal sources of funding for these sorts of things. Uh, I know, for example, the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, has a housing trust that could be used for this sort of thing. Um, if you are in, if your community is a CDBG or home entitlement community, those funds could be used, but recognize there you would be, you would have to be income qualifying the tenants. Um, land trusts, that is a great suggestion. And there are a number of land trusts uh, across the country, I'd say, particularly focusing probably in, like in Vermont and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there are a lot of land trusts that are active. So they, the land trusts, the uh, community land trusts uh, retain title to the land and sell the units to purchasers. Uh, and they tend to control the, um, the, a, the, the uh, equity that a property owner would get on reselling the home. So it gets reinvested in the property and reinvested in the land trust itself so it can perpetuate its mission. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with land trusts that have specifically worked with ADUs, but it seems like that's something that they should be very interested in. Um, so 
Bill is asking, what are some methods to promote ADUs? Some communities permit them, but that's not much implementation. Yeah, so this is this is a, a really good question because it's it's one thing to say, yeah, you can do it. And it's another, another thing to say, yeah, let's help you do it. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, you look to um, the information in in Cole Peterson's book, Back to a Revolution, look to uh, New Hampshire Housing's forthcoming homeowner's guide. Uh, I think the, the way to promote it is to let people know that they can do it, one. Because a lot of people, uh, you look at a zoning ordinance, and, and planners are familiar with them. They're, they're used to reading them. They can pick them apart and understand what they, how one section relates to another. But they're pretty Byzantine. And for the casual reader, someone who's not familiar with reading this stuff, it is pretty daunting. Uh, so come up with a guide, a simple guide that walks people through the process. Want to establish an ADU? Here's how. That's a way of promoting it without spending much money. Um, question from Christina. You know if the 2018 ICC maintains the 70 square foot minimum? I don't know. I've not seen the provisions of the 20, uh, 2018 uh, International Residential Code. Uh, my guess is it does maintain the 70 square foot minimum because that was a pretty radical change, or no, not radical, but it was an important change, a significant change in the term, in the words of the ICC. It was a significant change to the, the residential code. I'd be surprised if they, they went back on that, but I, I don't know uh, for certain. Um, oh, okay, so here's a question from Gregory. Any problems from the perspective of UPS, USPS, FedEx, or UPS deliveries? Will they deliver to the ADU if they don't have a record of the unit or the tenant occupant? Okay, let's back up a little bit. This is a dwelling unit, and it should have an E911 address so that emergency, let's forget about the deliveries. Can the fire department find you when your house is on fire? Can the ambulance get to you when you're lying on the floor bleeding or having a heart attack? That's the really important thing. So these, and that's one of the reasons I talked about informal housing. This is one really important reason why we need to bring these things uh, out of the shadows and into the light regulate them reasonably so that emergency responders know where the heck they're supposed to go when they get the call. Uh, it's around the back in this door that's hidden by garbage cans because I don't want anyone to know. Well, you know, that's not great. Um, so if there is a legitimate address, the Postal Service and FedEx and UPS will make the delivery one way or another. So I live way out in the country. I live on a dirt road that's three miles out of town. My driveway is 1,600 feet long and steep and winding. UPS doesn't go to the top of my driveway. Leave, they leave the box at the bottom and they beep their horn on their way out. Um, but I get the delivery. Uh, here's a question from Jim. Have you or others noted improvements to neighborhoods due to ADUs? In other words, are there documented examples where they have provided a needed shot in the arm to a low mod area or an area in decline? Um, you know, this is a great question. I don't have examples of it, but uh, I want to go out looking for them now um, because this is this really flies in the face of the fears that a lot of people have, uh, the, the NIMBY factor, if you will, uh, about the creation of accessory dwellings, the, the advent of a rental unit next door. Um, in fact, if they're done well, they can really add to value. So the the examples that I gave both from Oregon and from New Hampshire uh, in the early portion of the presentation, which some people didn't get to see, but you can see the slides later, uh, all depict really beautiful uh, construction. And in preparation for doing our municipal guide, uh, I went out and took some pictures in, um, in a community in New Hampshire of accessory dwellings that I thought would look good. Not all of them did. Some of them were kind of trashy, and but you know you look at single-family homes. Some of them are beautiful, and some of them are kind of trashy. Uh, so it, it's going to depend upon the owner uh, and what uh, they're willing to do with their property, how well they're willing to maintain the property. So it is it is an open question. Uh, comment from Christina: Our fire department requires additional separate address for new units. Yes, they should. Uh, most delivery problems I've experienced. 
uh, have more to do with services utilizing Google Maps <laughs> and those not being up to date. Yes. Um, so the, the road I live on is a dead end dirt road and we get people trying to drive through it to the nearby ski area and they get stuck and have to be pulled out. Uh, so and so someone has put on the uh, sign on my road that reads dead end. Uh, they've scrawled on it. Your GPS is lying. It really is dead end. Um, let's see other questions people have. Um, <laughs> I have to get through all of the comments people made about seeing my dog. I, I am sorry about that. Let's see. I think we may be at the end of questions. Oh, here's another one. Um, uh, interesting discussion, um, good points. I think more discussion is needed on other community impacts of increasing population density and municipal services, most importantly, school expenses. This was assumed to be a big problem in New Jersey in the 1960s as large Victorian era homes were converted to multifamily. So this is a good point. And I, I, I think we need to dig into the, the data on housing uh, housing supply and the impact of new residential construction on uh, schools in particular. So um, as, as I've said before, I work for New Hampshire Housing and there's the, the logo of, of our, my organization. Um, we have commissioned a number of studies uh, that look at precisely that question. What is the impact of new residential construction and we can we can infer we can assume that a a creation of an accessory dwelling unit is tantamount to new residential construction it creates a new dwelling unit um, what's the impact of that new residential construction on school age population and so we've looked at a variety of different uh, communities in new hampshire different sizes different parts of the state and we've matched uh the addresses of the new residences with the students in the schools. Now we don't, it's anonymous. We don't know the, we don't know the addresses. We don't know the data, but we supply the information to the school district and they give it back to us. <clears throat> and what we've found is that uh, there is a, a dramatically, and this is what, frankly, what we expected to find based upon our understanding of, of the census data. Uh, there is a dramatically decreasing impact of new residential construction on, on school populations. But, and more important to this question, um, is that the impact is directly related to the number of bedrooms in the housing unit. Accessory dwelling units tend to have one or two bedroom units. Those are going to have very few kids associated with them. Now, the problem I have with this whole argument is that uh, kids are evil. And that's the perception. Kids are a problem because they are a burden on the taxpayers. Well, you know, th this is something that we have to get over as a society. Um, is It's a reflection, yes, of um, the, the tax structures, the revenue structures are, of some of our states. And, you know, New Hampshire is um, among the uh, most obvious examples of that with our heavy reliance on the local property tax. We don't have a state income tax. We don't have a state sales tax. We really rely on the local property tax to run most of what uh, we do here, other than the state government, which is a different question. Um, so the concern uh, then is, well, all these kids coming in because of these new housing units, is I'm going to wind up paying for their education. Well, okay, who paid for your education? Um, in fact, a lot of our uh, school districts are declining, have declining enrollment. Uh, not all, but a lot of them are. So I think we need to get over this this problem of kids being a burden rather than, you know, when, when I walk the streets of my community, I want to hear the laughter of children. I don't want to be living in some uh, children of men dystopian future. Uh, that's, that's not the kind of place I want to live in. Uh, and I encourage you to ask that question. Let's see, who else do we have? 
I think we are about at the end of questions. Um, here's my contact information. The best way to reach me is by email. I'm often out of the office and not, uh, I'm not able to answer the phone. But if you have questions about the New Hampshire law or suggestions for things that we want to be looking into uh, with regard to ADUs, please get in touch with me. Really appreciate it. And thanks for bearing with the technical difficulty. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the image of my dog, Lodi. He's a real sweetie. Um, and make sure you tune in next week for Gabe Klein's great presentation as well. And with that, I'm going to close the presentation, and we will see you next time around. Thanks very much.